live. Okay. So actually, pretty good news today. So everybody, come on in, come on in. Uh, and also for the remote. I'm actually testing in the background. So that's my room. You see this one. And uh, the one with the bowl in it. That's my other room. And I actually wanted to see, like, uh, I got my nice computer set up there, and but I'm recording now from the Hab Lab here. Um, I was I was gonna ask, is it is, is it workable? And we'll test it actually. Katarina will get on there a little later. Is it workable? Because I have my three monitor set up where I can do free cat and sweet home at the same time, and it helps in the presentation. So I actually would like to ask if I can do that um, tomorrow. Let's try that. So that I can show my screen in a much better way. That my my desk, desktop is much faster than my laptop. Is that can that work? Let's let's try that tomorrow. Cause I, see, cause I'm in the morning. I'm setting up all all the documents. I go my windows open. Now here I have to kind of like open everything up again. So I think it will help a little bit. So let's try it tomorrow. Let's see let's see how it works. Whether the presence is good. Uh, so reporting from yesterday. It's actually a very positive day yesterday. Uh, after school here, we did some of the builds. You can look at the video once again. Uh, so as we speak in the background, I'll play the video from yesterday uh, on YouTube. Also, go to, go to the current working doc, which is the 120 Design Lessons. Uh, I'll paste that in. Uh, day five, day six. It's already day six. Um, so you, you can enter the working doc there and also let me share that uh, take a look at some of the videos I'm sharing my screen um, and I'd like to ask if any other people have uploaded theirs but uh, I've got a couple of nice ones so these are pretty good um, that's what's happening on the ground uh, after this session I ended up going to Kansas City and met with some people at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, as well as two people from BNIM Architects. That's a world-renowned firm, if you know the name. They're the people responsible for the LEED certification and the Living Building Challenge certification. So these are high-power people. They happen to be in Kansas City, so we're actually quite set in terms of a collaboration. They're actually interested in helping, so they're going to collaborate with us. They're going to take a look at our CD Go Home. And we're going to look for a lot in Kansas City. And there's a lot of them. There's like 3,000 lots that a certain organization owns that are pretty much development land for community land trust kind of a thing. So, but the first meeting was actually with another guy. They have a new center, a pretty high power. It's, it's an advanced hacker space at Kansas City. Uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, they've got like metal 3D printers and galore immersive AR. VR environments, testing, drones, like all that kind of stuff. We actually have access to that. So we can actually consider doing a collaborative session there. We have to think about what all the details would look like, but it turns out we have access to that. It's open to the community if you have some connections uh, with any kind of project, which we already do because Brian, one of our fellows, one of our apprentices, actually teaches at UMKC. He teaches social enterprise. Uh, he's connected to the people that run that center, that's a physics professor, also the vice chancellor, um, who happens to be one of our friends there, so we've got connections. Uh, very nice, very nice. So we do have access to it. Now, the even more interesting thing was a meeting with, so I met with Jesse, the, a guy who works with Tony Caruso, who's the vice chancellor, actually, and, and they do a lot of work on, on grant writing. So I got filled in on on two options, which are SBIR and STTR grants, which are fun, they, they get that funded by the Department of Defense. Now that kind of sounds sounds funny there, but but actually they, they really like open source, and I was encouraged to apply for this. Like, and actually this could apply to any of us here. So what I found out was that in where we are right now, with numerous prototypes on a lot of the things we have done, we're in a really good position that very high likelihood of getting just about yes. anything we apply again. Uh, so that's, to that's pretty amazing. Uh, let me see what happened. Did you see my video? Uh, so let me stop sharing. You can take a look at the the videos. Okay, sorry guys. So 
Let's see. Part library show me all the what is parts that we have in there. And as I speak, so I'm trying to erase that one I'm getting to get back. Not to mute yourselves outside of this. We've got, and we also are going to need a nine to me. Sorry. That's the thing I'm playing another one. I wasn't, I wasn't talking <laughs> there. Um, okay, so with respect to those grants, the way it works is you apply and and they fund you. It's, it's called dual use. They, they, the Department of Defense uses SBIR grants apparently, and there's other government agencies like like FDA and other things where they they get small enterprise to do effective startup research and development that, that either they or anyone in the public can use. So, so actually it's very much open source friendly. I always ask the first question is, can the results be open source? And they said, yeah, there's not an issue with that, no issues with that. And we can, so we can develop, have the government fund the development, and it actually ends up in the public domain, as it should. Um, now, that's the freedom up to, to whoever is applying for the grant. But the idea is that not only that, but they typically like to pair up with some kind of a reconstruction agency within a, what they do, as far as the group there, uh, within a, the Department of Defense, where after, after various wars or events that they get into, they, they have two branches. One is like restoration and actually trying to help people out. So I was pleased to find that since about two decades, uh, the stand of the military was, okay, we got to actually try to build the communities back up and, and the channels of the, these SBI are, are grants are, can be used exactly for that purpose where there's reconstruction work going on and they want that. So anything with respect to enterprise development, training, agriculture, machinery, I mean, totally up our alley in terms of startup of a small enterprise, a distributed enterprise around the world in places that needed it most. So it's like, wow. And I was told, so Jesse told me that we are very likely to get that because we have prototypes. And we've already built and used a lot of the things. So, so, so I, we'll, we'll go about it. The next cycle is, is uh, August. And their turnaround is like 45 days. So, so the first, like they, they give you 50K for the initial study. Then it's 750k and then a few million. We actually roll out. The, the deal is rolling out products. Well, how about one of these for each of our technologies for the house for everything? So, so what it turns out is uh, we have access uh, through through our network here uh, to all those kinds of things. We you know we talked about these kinds of things frequently. Okay, how do you do development work? How do you train vets? There's also a vet connection because Jesse happens to be a vet, so we're well connected to all the, the veterans, groups, uh, housing, housing projects within Kansas City through BNIM and Brian and also Jesse's group. So this is really good. It's like we have a plate of things that we want to do most and people that are very much interested in providing funding for that, for public interest research. So man, I was somewhat blown away because um, Seems like a lot of the people that apply for the SBIRs, they do end up getting the, the grants. The percentage is not bad. It's, I, I didn't really get a straight answer of what the percentage was. Um, I got an answer uh, when we were talking about it, it might be like 30% or something. Um, I was told there was one figure I heard. I'm not sure about what exactly it is, but it's, it appears to be that a lot of people don't apply for this. But there's a billion dollars that gets given out like that to small enterprise every year. So billion dollars in the United States. Wow. That's quite a bit of projects that can be funded and therefore our chance is quite good. The thing is, the other item about that is uh, you typically pair up with a, with a reconstruction agency and I, I don't exactly know what they all are throughout the, the federal government uh, and the military where they actually buy your product. You have a, cus a, a captive customer this is your client, you actually, it's like you're doing pre-sales. So the marketing is already done. It's like, wow, so I asked, well, if we develop some of this, okay, say we're training people somewhere, uh, somewhere in the world or, or starting enterprise anywhere, and it could be US or it could be somewhere else. Um, 
do you actually have to figure out the market and get your customers? Well, actually, they are your customer. You you sell to them. So it sounded very very compelling. Like, this is something definitely to look into. Now tonight we have the enterprise session. So we're gonna go. Let's go from 5:30 to 7:30. And um, what we'd like to do tonight is go through a survey of all kinds of revenue models that we can think of and just and so first survey of the enterprise and business development opportunity around the global village construction set and then actually start getting uh, real numbers we can perhaps work a little bit mostly like the survey discussing like okay what exactly are the options that are, are in front of us what's likely that we can plug into what are the plain revenue based business models and if we if we say we can do the house at 100k well yeah we better prove that we can do that at that that amount of money um, the people from BNIM that I talked to uh, so that was Craig and Jeremy so they've been with the company for a long time uh, so we talked about the CD go home they were like ah okay okay so that we were kind of getting into the details here's the foundation here's the walls and they they definitely agree on the price point of materials they're like how are you going to get that build and a sustainable operation if you're charging 50k for a thousand square foot house so we got into that kind of a discussion and uh, they didn't they didn't dismiss it outright but their cost when they're doing similar work it's costing them 200,000 for similar work um, so there's a potential of a good collaboration there that uh, as I uh, as I said if, if our stuff works people are going to pick that up it's, it's a question of making it work making it effective and I found a, a new word like BIM so BIM you might might know what that is building information modeling uh, so I told them we're actually going to design everything down to the last screw I said oh yeah that's BIM 500 it's a certain level of how much detail you go into in a given model and they're like whoa like nobody ever does that so we are do we are doing that because we want a digital you know, full digital detail that allows us to a lot of things to do a lot of things with that after that but I could kind of see it uh, one thing I did see is that um, they were definitely questioning can you get that okay so Jeff you want to meet him that's probably Yeah, I think it's the fridge coming in. Um, so they were uh, they were questioning how you do it, but it was clear that they had a complete breakdown between. They just basically pass it on to the builders. Builders have their costs. We're saying we're capturing that value, uh, so we have because the. Room there, coming through. Okay, uh, refrigerator coming in. So, it was rather positive. Yeah, sorry, sorry guys here. We're, we've got a refrigerator delivery this this morning since ours has been out the border. Uh, we'll just wait 45 minutes. Let's, let's take a five minute break here. Um, so for anyone that's listening to it, any immediate questions or insights that you might have that come up? Because this thing about the grant opportunities yeah. is quite interesting. I have a question. Uh, here's one. It's really cool. It sounds really exciting. Um, and uh, I, I kind of wanted to ask this gentleman. Mentioned uh, partnering with the university out there. Are we open to other collaborations? I've yeah. I've been wanting to reach out to the uh, uh, right next to Cornell. Yeah. And I know I know they're doing some really cool stuff with housing. And is there any reason that I should reach out to them, assuming they're on board with the open source aspect of it? All we need is that they're they're going to collaborate openly and document and beyond that absolutely yes you should do that we should pursue all this kind of stuff kind of theme so i presented also at brian's uh social enterprise class last night and the theme was like the theme that was coming up it's like why are people not doing this why is there not more happening 
a lot of the answer was around people actually collaborating and getting together and talking to each other because in any entity, whether you're a university or anywhere else, you're kind of siloed off into your disciplinary uh, work. But the potential there is huge for collaboration everywhere, like students doing projects on this work. Uh, whatever center that does affordable building work, like in Kansas City we're trying to get hooked up with all these organizations that do similar work, including things like workforce training, veterans housing where there's money that the government has to take care of our veterans here in this country, there's plain affordable housing issues, we're spanning across so much of this, essentially the whole infrastru infrastructure of civilization here. I mean, we've got a lot of opportunities, and we should pursue them. And it's, I think it just boils down to entrepreneurial savvy in terms of enterprise models that work. Here's the numbers, here's the product, and here's who pays for it. And those have to add up with a very basic statement that a sustainable business has to bring in more money than it spends. An obvious statement, which which most businesses fail at because most businesses end up folding after some time. So opportunities are there and definitely encourage that and, and we have the extra privilege of working openly so we can invite people from across the, across the board. And I think our opportunity is exactly that, that we can step across boundaries without fear of the kind of scarcity issues, mindset issues that come up in any kind of development so there's huge potential. Just like, um, you know, the, the case of Microsoft, well, now Microsoft versus like hardware. So in hardware right now, nobody is supporting this kind of work, like companies are not. You know, we just took a look at the, the facility there, Stratasys, Fortis, 450, 3D printers, highly proprietary, $200,000 price tag. We'll probably build something comparable for five or 10K, uh, things like that. Um, but no, they're not funding open source projects. They're, that's high proprietary art. Uh, but just like Microsoft scorned Linux and s said it was a curse and a, and a plague to, to revenue <laughs> models, now Microsoft is the number one supporter. So that's how it works. We develop the product to a certain point. It becomes adopted. It moves forward. That's what we're after here. And we're in our stages of making that happen somewhat through the grassroots bootstrap funding, we're not, not opposed to any kind of grants or anything like that. We just never did that because we were too busy cranking out prototypes, spending all our resources on buying steel and prototyping. So we just never got into that, that part of the, the, you know, there's the government, private enterprise, um, nonprofits, um, public sector. We didn't get into much outside of the kind of the nonprofit Entrepreneurial nonprofit, however, um, that kind of a world where we did bootstrap funded revenue from workshops and product sales. But we can get a lot of help because the, the facts are the hardware is very expensive. Like when we're building this, the next CD go home here for the workshop, I mean, we got to come up with $40,000. That's, you know, that's serious. Um, and we have that, but, you know, that kind of stretches us. So at the end of the year, we're going to be. Uh, be happy if, if we're just broke, <laughs> you know. So uh, that's that's how it works. It takes a lot of money to uh, to develop hardware. And there's real costs involved. So any partnerships, like for example with UMKC, with the center that's got uh, all the advanced equipment, like these printers that I just mentioned, that we, we could actually use, and all that facilities and, and grants. That's all game. It's all game. Uh, it's, a, it's part of our mission to be inclusive. So the collaborative design for a transparent and inclusive economy of abundance. We have to include everybody because ultimately we're on all together. That's me sounding like a broken record. I always say that. Um, and we do believe that and we do practice that. So, so that's, that's that. What are some of the specific things, Matt, that you, you think you can do at, at Cornell? I go there. Um, I'm in discussion with someone uh, locally who, who's um, like BIPOC farmer, uh, trying to make farming land and housing more accessible to them. And so she's partnering with Cornell uh, for involving housing. And I mentioned, you know. 
we're talking about 50, 50 grand in materials and maybe, you know, as high as 100 you know, labor and everything. And he thought that sounded amazing. So it sounds like it would be very competitive with what they're already doing. So I'm into it. Um, yeah. So I'll so, explore that. And, and I guess we should then kind of think we want to put me in. If, if some of us were applying for maybe work on certain projects, certain, you know, pointing out, you know, whether it's the CD Go Home or, uh, I, I'm personally interested in trying to make the uh, CD press okay. used with like a straw clay. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be both a good thermal mass mm -hmm. and insulation, groundbreaking. Yeah. Natural building world, right? Uh, so, so maybe working with them to kind of, uh, you know, test, you know, its 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 uh, properties when it comes to insulation and yes. structure stability and stuff like that. And so, so, yeah, I have to look a little bit more, but yeah, um, there's a world yeah. of opportunity. If you do straw within the compressor block, you're weakening the the block. You can do it; it will be less strong. You might want to consider separating, so you've got a strong block. So, what we've done here in this building, we actually did walls with two layers of block and straw insulation in between. So this building has that right now. You don't see it because it's behind wooden, uh, actually vinyl siding, but that's what we did here. And that that absolutely works. You got three straw, you got to protect it from insects and, and protect it from, like put some borax in there. So you, at that level, if you want to do it properly, you have to have a mixer where you're throwing in some borax, basically like a small plant where you're, um, doing the, the proper steps to make biomass resistant for a long time. Because if you just throw biomass inside a wall, it will decompose. You can do straw bales, which, but once again, like the thing about straw bales, if you have any crack in that wall, you're just gonna get moisture in there and over time it's gonna turn into compost. And maybe if it stays there and it's still like a high, large bunch of compost, it's still insulating, but maybe that's not what you want compared to the original straw. So interesting about the compressor blocks is already, um, so the Department of Defense is actually, they have one project at a certain base where they are actually using CEBs for reconstruction work in other countries. So, okay, great, we have that contact. Let's see if this person is interested in a machine that's gonna be 5X uh, lower cost than industry standard. So that's a captive, um, potentially a captive market right there. And, so, and that applies to just about any project we have. Um, so think about, so the theme of an open source micro factory, that, that would be the, the golden thing. Let's just propose the open source micro factory. CNC torch table, 3D printers, printing from trash, induction furnace, you've got metal and, and plastic streams that are reformed back into advanced civilization, uh, CNC machines, so heavy duty CNC machines like with a two inch universal axis and so forth. We can implement that. Uh, so I think that's, that would be like a perfect project to, to get more money around because the budgets for that kind of thing to get it deployed out there, yeah, you're talking about you know, like a million bucks or something. I have a look on the link, there's a page called Africa Budget. I pretty much spec'd out of here's a low cost facility. Um, I'll put a link to that. It's kind of looking at numbers because somebody was um, looking at analyzing that, so Af I called it Africa Budget. Uh, but basically, an off grid micro fabrication facility, open source micro factory. Um, so that's in the chat. What are some of the costs involved and what are the capacities in there? Well, the only way this is going to work if all the equipment is open source because once it breaks, you need to repair it. And that's, that's an absolute, absolute requirement. So we're looking at how much does it take you to develop it? And I was saying, okay, in year one, you've got seven full-time engineers just cranking out, doing the final steps of the R&D. That's what we're doing here with our crew right now. We're doing the next prototypes of the torch tables and, and large printers and so forth. So we're doing that you know, without a budget, really. Um, but if you want to accelerate it, here's a, you know, budget is a million or two just to get that out within the next year or so. Uh, but that's the kind of time scales that these kinds of grants can, can give us, so this is really, really good. Um, I think the, the grants are actually huge in terms of form collaboration. Yeah, we've never, never tapped it. I think we can, and we can 
it's kind of interesting maybe like all these 10 years you can look at it from one perspective oh yeah we did all the background due diligence to now go crazy on these grants maybe just the time is right right now according to what jesse was saying uh yesterday so and tonight we're gonna brian uh, i'm hoping brian can make it tonight to the the enterprise session and what we should do is actually invite jesse again to uh to give us a presentation on how does this thing work? How does government funding work? Because they're in that world. They understand it. They get millions of dollars. Like a, they got like 30 grants like last cycle or whatever. It's crazy. They're very successful. At it. So if you know how it works, we can open source that and get more open development happening that way. So that's pretty good. Odunda well, just had, started a doc on the enterprise development, so we'll continue that. I'll put that right into today's lesson, lesson doc. Uh, so I'm going to edit that. Let me see, let me share my screen here again. So the design lesson, so, so we'll turn into this. Uh, so this is what I want to cover today. I covered a little bit about this part here. Uh, if you look at the, the working dot, doc so the enterprise seminar um and we're going to put in a working doc right there yeah uh, so a survey of enterprise models getting and and then refining them into here's the numbers how this actually works just just little insights about operations the, the biggest thing we can we can open source for the world or help for the world to make this valuable for anybody is to expose how do these things work because we know right now that the insiders have that info and that's why they score and, and they don't share with anybody we can be in a different position we can say okay let's include everybody and make it easy for anybody like ourselves i mean all you guys all of us myself let's learn how to do this so we're in the future we don't have any issues with revenue and supporting important work uh, so understanding the system, here's the grant system, here's how you work with community organizations, like how does that work, how does the mayor and, you know, the nonprofit organizations, what are the power plays there and all that, what are, what are the leverage points of what the incentives for each party are, what do they look for, like those kinds of things, the, the inside entrepreneurial information. And we can really study that well for Kansas City because we've got the people in the building world from BNIM, we've got the university people, we've got Brian, regenerative work. So that's something we can study very explicitly, maybe document that uh, starting tonight in the Enterprise Seminar saying, okay, this is a survey of the kinds of enterprise we can get into. And then most important thing is, once again, it's, it's your product and sales at the end of the day if you're actually running a business, but um, who are our customers and, and what are the revenue streams that are already available that we can be tapping that we just don't know about or haven't bothered to do the due diligence to find out because it's hard to find this stuff out. Uh, not a lot of people are gonna be really sharing that in a very open way. Uh, we don't learn the best things uh, in school or or in available, commonly available public, public knowledge. So it's secret, but that's the use of open sourcing things. Okay, so let's get into a little more, uh, right into the subject matter of what we're doing. So let's talk about the substance, which is the CAS, which we're working on. So any comments on learning from yesterday, like within the team as far as the actual build? So we actually started building the window modules and uh, finishing up the corners. Anything to share about that? What were any blocks or anything like that? We did miscut one thing. I, I couldn't read things right off the CAD file. I put it, put it wrong cut, so we just fixed that relatively easily. Accidents like that. It was useful to catch, catch the sketches out of the FreeCAD document. If you click double, if the file has sketches in it, you can readily click on that sketch and get all the dimensions out. So as we build the document, like which you can see actually I carried it over on page six. I just put some critical features 
as far as what the lengths are, but here we had this 36.5. We actually had a 36, so we had to put a little spacer in. It's not super critical because the header is what carries all the, the two side studs on each side are really the critical thing. These ones below here are just supporting the weight of the window. All the, otherwise the weight of the second story is held upon the, uh, these side, two vertical studs on each side. Uh, that's what carries all that weight. And uh, we did a small window and a second story larger window of which these are four. And that's the, that's the current design. Uh, we are moving along in the graphics CAD library. Let's take a look at that in the part library. Um, but I think there's a lot that's still, well, not here. Let's go to SH2 and, and CAD. Um, we still have a lot, a lot, of, a lot of the rest, like the late, later modules here. There's hardly any of these three CAD ones that are left. But yesterday we talked about the concept of positioning correct files. So let's actually do that. So whatever file you worked on, let's go through a workflow where we determine that we build it, but not only build it, but build it positionally correct. So that when you merge it into the final document, it's actually the house with all the details. So you can think about, we can get to BIM 500 or whatever the word, word is, Google it. What's the depth of uh, detail within a building informa information modeling file? Um, if you want to go to the real detail, we can start with the modules, we can put them in the correct place. We can continue and continue adding that detail ad infinitum until it's a complete, absolutely complete model. So that's, that's the purpose. And then it's not a lot of work to actually put it into the final document and just, just re-merge, just delete that part and merge it back into the document. So probably what you want to do there is once you have the final detail, simplify it. So when you merge it into the final assembly, you just have this, okay, wall module 43 or the window, first floor window, call it whatever you want to call it so it's transparent within the part tree. So let's go to... Let's go through how we would do this. So let's take what we're doing right now and add the step of positional correctness. So at the end, as soon as you have the individual module, you actually have the correct house. That's powerful because then you don't have to spend a whole bunch of time trying to assemble these 100 modules into place. Uh, we set up the placeholders for them in a physical location. So look at my screen then. Um, so I'm gonna open up our free CAD and we talked about the coordinate system. What did we say? An XYZ Cartesian system, define a corner zero, zero, zero at the bottom. You're looking at the thing from the front, define it at the bottom left, just like in a real XYZ system. This is a standard. It's somewhat intuitive. We have to agree on something. We could agree, for example, that you're looking at from the back for some reason, but I think looking from the front and this is your coordinate system, that makes sense. So let's do that. So we start up a file, and I know that, um, so we're gonna start uh, part design, and I'm gonna go 32 by 16. That's the exact footprint upon which our house lays. Let's do that right now. X, Y, so does X, Y plane make sense for the foundation, for the place where we put the modules? It's looking top from the top down if you're looking at the XY plane like we are right now. That makes sense because we have, if you put all the modules in there, yes, you can put all the modules and see each one if you're looking from top down. Makes sense. XY plane. So I do a, do me a little rectangle of, of 16 by 32. So that's going to be 32 feet. And that's going to be, oh, is that inches? Okay, uh, so 392. Uh, 392, is that 16 times 12? So we bust out our uh, 12 times 32, <clears throat> 384. And then the other one is 192, I believe. 192, there we go. 
Okay, so, and let's also make it a little easier here. So let's take this corner and we have the zero, you see the origin coordinate axis of FreeCAD? That's where zero is gonna be. So why don't we take those two points and constrain them to one? That's it, so we're actually starting, that's the zero, zero, zero corner, bam. Now we can put all our modules here. Where's module one? Module one is right here in this corner. So I'm gonna take that, um, I'm gonna go download the first, first module. <laughs> so we got the CAD, we go into the library, take the first one right here, sehwall1.fcstd, download it. And one step we might want to take, so let's open, let's actually first, first open that one, this wall one, and let's look at what's in the part tree. All right, it's a full detailed file with all the sketches. Well, if we're doing a final assembly, so let's now call this foundation. First, I'm going to save this and upload it as our, this is our grid, this is where we're going to build. And this is like selecting a site out where the site is right now in the forest. We've selected it, we selected it here in the digital world at the, world at the coordinate of zero, zero, zero on the corner. So this one needs to be saved. So this is um, foundation location or house location file. This is our house location, let's call it. So <clears throat> we're gonna I'm going to do my whole process here. I'm going to take a screenshot. That's for the image gallery. Uh, we can save that. And we're going to go, since now we're doing a final assembly, let's, let's keep, keep this at the, at the CAD location here. So let's, let's just say up front on top of these, all these modules, the first thing will be our location file. So I'm going to just edit this one and add one item to the part library here. So this one here, I'm going to copy that. Uh, so I'm up here. So I'm going to say house location and then file. Now what is it? What am I? No, wrong, wrong. I'm, I'm at the wrong place. That's the that's the visual history. Um, here we are under the gallery. Okay, see here's the gallery. That's where it actually starts. Above that, we have all the visual history. So the gallery starts right here. I copied this one over from the one before. So this is gonna be house location. So we're gonna call that the house location master. And then in FreeCAD, we're going to upload that in FreeCAD, and we're going to use a thumbnail. So I want to keep that same as the image. So house location. There we go. So now I set up a placeholder for the house location file within a part library. I'm going to add the, the thumbnail. One easy way if you, well, I'm going to put that, I'm going to work with the, the visual history concept, and I'm going to add my image to the visual history right there as well. So if you take a look at this is where we've got the visual history. We've got, I'm gonna copy that and that's house location. So that once I put that into the part library, uh, sorry, the, the visual history, this house location is gonna appear right here within a th as a thumbnail within an actual part library. So now I've got this link that I can click on and I'll upload my my screenshot here. So there we go. And likewise, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go to the CAD. Uh, go back to so that it didn't refresh yet, but it's it's there. Now I'm gonna upload the FreeCAD file. So let's do that. This is the house location of FreeCAD 2.9K. Um, just upload that. And it always gets me these messages. Are you sure you want to do that? It looks like the other file. Well, it's not. Ignore and save it anyway. 
and then now we've got it. So uh, let's go to the part library. Uh, no, right here. Uh, we should set up a link. Like since we use, we know we use this CAD, and we use this. So here's the CAD, and here's where our actual FreeCAD library is. This everyone should set up. Put a bookmark on that. This is the SH2 CAD. We use that all the time, just bookmark it. Um, so uh, that should appear, that's right there. It's up in my bookmarks up on top. I'll put it where it's readily accessible. I click on that and I'm always getting to it. So you see I put in this, this location file it's right there, you already have this location, so right there you can work from this right now. Now, let's put in the first module, so so after saving that, um, I'm gonna save that as the actual house. This is it, this is where we're actually building our final house, so, so this is the house. <clears throat> so, CD Home 2, house model, house model, and this is our Final assembly. I mean, let's call it, we're working actually on the final assembly of the entire house. We're putting module by module into it. All of us together. Final assembly. Now, before that, we might go into, okay, first floor assembly, second floor. We can do that as well. So we can break this down in different levels. But here, let's, let's go for it all. We've got it here. Uh, so that's where we are. Merge workflow. So we go to file, merge project. Merge Seeker Home Wall 1. Okay, so it appears in this, this kind of way. Well, that's not right. Uh, first of all, what I will do uh, for this wall file, remember what we talked about? You want to, once you do large assemblies, get rid of all the detail. So right now, I want to take all of this and make it into a single item in the part tree. We do what we said yesterday. So just select it all. Um, house model well for that now I'm working in my final assembly so no go back to the source file so open that up again you got your wall module one and I'm going to re-upload this to the FreeCAD uh, library so it's the most recent file and we're going to probably have to make a note note this is just a stripped down simplified version so if you're actually working on modifying this or learning from it or getting dimensions you download the former versions but here um, so I know, so I'm going to close that one uh, since I don't want to get confused. So here's my part tree, right? Part tree right there. I'm going to take all of that. What do I do? Part workbench. Part. Not part design, part. Part workbench. Uh, now take all those pile, files, make compound, and then part, make simple copy. There we go. So now I can delete the compound. It spit out all its parts, because I deleted that container, delete all those parts, delete all the sketches underneath. That's what this kind of thing that happens here. So this compound, okay, this left stud, oh, okay, for some reason that one was already in there like that, so we've got to compound that too. Make compound, and then part. Okay, so now you got to select that part, create simple copy, and then erase the former spits out its contents and this is it this is our wall module one or we can call it well what do we call these things what's the most most apparent we could call it um, first floor corner first floor short side corner shorts the technical description is first side first floor short side corner right front that's what we define as one it's right front so the simple conventions here forward forward and uh, at front back left right so to define this exactly first floor short side corner right front because you have two short side corners on the right so you need to say front um, I mean, that's, that's the actual full name that you cannot confuse this with anything else in the file. So when you're then searching your part tree, you say, oh, I, I want this one. I want the first floor 
short side corner, front, there. Okay, so it's a single thing. Now you can't, when you look at this, you no longer can can extract any anything out of it. Like, if you double click on it, the entire thing lights up. It's a one one thing. So that's that's what you have. And it's got nice colors, I'll save that. Uh, so save it and now upload it. So upload it first, let's save this to the original part library in module one. So I'm gonna go to module one, FreeCAD, and then I'll upload a new version here. And I'm gonna call that simplified dumb object um, upload the file the, you're not overriding this this the whole history is kept there which is good uh, and you can tell the uh, memory it takes it's 12 compared to 43 so you can expect that the 12 has less detail than the 43 if it's a more recent file that means it has to be a stripped down version of the former now with this sometimes it's a good idea just to confirm that you down uploaded the correct file so you might want to typically like click on this and download it so you make sure you didn't upload something else I mean that that's if you want to double check I'm not gonna do that right now since I mentioned there is a bug in the wiki that if you upload something it takes takes like a day before you can download it but other people can download it immediately right now what it would do if I clicked on this wall one I would actually get the second one I, I know there's a bug there and this is PHP maybe we can fix this somehow but uh, that's been a bug and I don't know if that's actually a systems wide bug within uh, within Wikimedia altogether we were never able to track it down because a lot of people, well, we just never went too deep into it to solve that bug. Uh, it may be fixed in the official Wikimedia, MediaWiki version. So, go back to the FreeCAD. Now, we've got this file. Um, I like to keep things transparent. That's, that's another thing, actually, uh, transparency. Because once you're looking at the whole model, you want to be able to look inside it looks one, it kind of looks cool. Second is you can actually see what's inside and give you more information. So let's actually save another one that's transparent. So uh, double click on it and then do appearance and do like 50%. Um, yeah. The only thing that happened is once you make it transparent, you actually lost the colors and I think that's somewhat of a bug. But that's what happens. But let's save this anyway because this is useful because you can first of all see like from the front you can see the studs inside and things like that. Now this is still not finished so this is not like the thing that we're going to keep in the final BIM 500 model. This is a intermediate step and we'll keep uploading over this once we get more details such as like all the other things. The, the house wrap, the interior, any electrical insulation, flashing, any other things that uh, the sill gasket, screws, that's all, all going to go in here. For now, let's re-upload that real quick. Uh, so let's do that. So I'm just going to say transparent version. Uh, uh, upload a new version, transparent. Uh, so I just did that. So this is a lot of housekeeping. You have to keep track of all, all this stuff. Uh, and see, I forgot to... Uh, I was talking and I forgot to say that's a transparent version, so I'm going to go back and edit and say notes. I'm going to say V, I forget what it was, uh, is a transparent copy. That's good to note stuff like that so, so that somebody doesn't have to download before they found out. Found out. Um, so that's, I'm going to say, I'm going to just click that V. Um, bold that up so it looks like the thing same thing is a transparent version of the last file there we go um, to make it transparent you double click on it double click so you select it and then right click and appearance 
and you select the toggle. You can change the colors so you can make it nice and green. Okay. Uh, so now it's green. Um, so this is the file we have and this is what I'm going to work with. So I'm going to uh, get out of this one. So I'm going to now going back to the final the final assembly. So okay, start from scratch. We've got the first module that we know is in the right format. We've got proper part labeling. We got transparency. So now we go open up my master file. So see Eco Home 2 house model final assembly. There it is. My flat panel there. I'm going to trash that because now it's still in a in a old format. That's my old file. Just get rid of that. Oh now all the sketches got spit out. Erase that. Oops, not that one. Not the. So how do you tell which sketch is which? You click on a part. Okay, so it's that this sketch that I don't want to erase. That that's what turned green. That's what I'm selecting. So I want to keep that. So I'm going to erase everything else. Delete. And then delete that. So I've got my my proper coordinate system. And now I'm gonna. No, not do this. Not open new file. Merge. This is merge project and then wall one. So now we should still have the same one, it's still in the same position because you see that all the time it retains its position unless you change it in the original file. So now I'm going to move this over. So now I go into draft. I'm going to move this in this plane, so what I do, I first select the, the view window, then I move it. And I move it. Uh, don't copy it, you can copy it and move it. Don't toggle the copy on. So. Uh, so I'm going to move it to my corner. Great. I'm going to go to another window where I can rotate it. So which from this, okay, now I can stand it up. So this is like handling it in real life. You, you look at it from this YZ perspective. So that's button one, two, three. There's four, five, six. Button three gets you this right position that you can twist it. So now rotate it. Now it's a different plane. So make sure you select the plane to be the view plane. Now I'll just do my rotation here. So I'm going to take a corner, do that, and stand it up. I'm going to type in 90 in an angle window. So right here, type 90. There you go. Now I'm going to move it to, well, I actually have to do another rotation, right? Because where are we right now? It's standing to the front. We need to rotate it uh, this way so it stands the proper direction here. So once again, go back to the proper view and then rotate it. Um, okay, so, so select your object. Ah, I'm moving it. Close. So rotate um, like that. So once again, go into the rotation window there. If you just start typing, it types that into the rotation window. So there. Now move it into the final position. Uh, let's move it right here. Okay, so now you're starting to see how this stuff goes together. You see, why was that lib there? It's because there's a wall here in the front. Well, so put it in there, exactly like this. Uh, we know the where where is it going to be? Like right against the side, like a little before it. Where's where am I going to put it? You tell me. If you know about this module, is that correct? Uh, as far as the edge going in the y direction, this direction, is that we line it up right there? Is that correct? Is this supposed to go down? Like the the line is the face of. <coughs> The foundation? It is. It's 16 by 32. It's the foundation. It's where the sit sill plate, that's the outer edge of the sill plate. So you sit the, the wall down on the line then, and not on top of it. Yeah, so where are we now? Okay, well, first of all, there's a little, if that's going to be our foundation, let's define it as a foundation. Um, we got to sit on top. So that's, that's incorrect. I got to move that. But I'm asking about this one here, is that correct there? Uh, no. No? Okay, so you probably want to move it... 0.75 inches? Yeah, 5 eighths inch like this. You want this? And I'm like, okay, so this is a little bit off there. We can, you know, we can zoom in and we can move it actually to the exact place. So, I mean, you don't need really more detail. Well, let's let's move it. See, like when you, you just zoom in, you can move it in very, very close to actual location. That's a very easy way to do it. Otherwise, you have constraints. But 
<clears throat> since we don't have anything to constrain to really yet, you know, we're just moving it. But if you zoom out to where it is, you, I mean, that's that's as exact as you ever need because in real life you you won't build it this exact anyway. So don't get hung up on being super precise. Uh, it's part of the uh, understanding tolerancing. Understand that you don't don't worry about snapping it or whatever. It's fine. Just keep going. Um, It'll train you for the reality, because in reality you'll see that things don't line up ever, and, and wood bends, and so don't fool yourself starting here. <laughs> uh, that's my philosophy on it. Okay, so we said, we move it on a, so if you make it disappear, uh, space bar, this is actually not, not it. We gotta put this outside, because it's the, the frame that sits on the sill plate. So actually, after you consider the sheeting, we end up with 16 feet and 5 eighths inch or 32 feet 5 eighths inches here and then another 5 eighths inches on the other side that's how it works that makes it much simpler because that allows us to do a 16 by 32 and have the actual framing not the sheeting line up otherwise you have to cut everything by a little bit uh, you'd have to cut stuff above leave it at the because because you're concerned about the wood members the framing is what really matters that's what you're measuring from so we leave it actually outside uh it's so the house is actually 32 feet and a little bit like a little over one inch at the end of the day if you consider the exterior sheeting the framing is exactly 16 by 32 so that's the point to remember and that's because the bottom sill plate is exactly 16 by 32 and that's why the foundation is exactly 16 by 32. That makes it easy. We didn't want to make it like 16, 1 and 32, 1 to accommodate that. You could, but that's harder to keep track of maybe because um, it's not simple 16 by 32. It's just easier to, okay, keep that plywood outside, steer plywood. So the final thing is, um, okay, so in view, so that's, First of all, we had to move it uh, up and down a little bit. This is our X Z plane. So now let's let's move it here in the view window. So click the move and grab the corner. Well, it wants to. Ah, okay. So I didn't see it moved. It. What did I do there? I don't know what I did. Um, okay, I I got out of the plane. So once again, go into the view plane move it you gotta select what you're moving and now we're gonna move that yeah so we'll, we'll take a couple of turns well no no no. i mean it's, so that's the drip edge that goes below right so no that's not right that's not where you're going you're going you got this thing you're moving this corner to this very corner here now there you go that's the drip edge dripping over the foundation where it's going to be in the future this thing is sitting here properly okay so vertically we're pretty good like it it's pretty tight um now let's look at some other angles is that correct this way yes that is How about three is that finished looks like I don't see anything else. What else do we have to fix? Uh, the drip edges from the top. Yes, this edge is here. You need to check three orientations. So if you go through one, two, three, you'll see whether anything is wrong. So one, yes, that's in a standing up on a Z direction. On a, that's the foundation here, good. Number two, yes, this is the XY plane. Yes, the, the panel sheathing is going all the way to the corner. Okay, little detail. Maybe, should that be 5 eighths inch below? What's the reasoning there? It's not, but why not? Why is why does it end up exactly there? Can someone explain it? Because you might think, okay, well, if we just have, remember we said we're outside by 5 eighths inch, so if you consider that, well, maybe this is also down, outside going down. How do you logic that out? Is the long corner also have Yes. Yes, everywhere. Yes. So, yeah, that's kind of the answer. It's going to stick out there, but that little corner there, 
will be like a notch out there, which we're going to cover with trim. So the point is, yes, this is right, but I really know that because how wide are these panels? 48. 48 inches? Yeah, so it has to end up on this because it's exactly four of these make 16 feet. So yes, it does end up on it. The sheathing ends up being 48, uh, but the actual framing does not. Okay, so more logic. What is the distance between this line, so that line right there, and the edge of the foundation? How do you tell that without measuring? So you got to know this. This is your understanding the conceptual design. What is that? Yeah. Therefore, it's a 5.5 inch distance. So if we measure that, is that going to be 5.5? It better be. Well, okay, see what happened there? That's. Um, so I got to look at it from the other side. Now I'm looking at it from below. So now I should get, it better be 5.5, yeah, sure is. So we're good. And, and is that the same width as, as the piece below it? I just grabbed it. I guess the width of, of that hole, yeah, it's not the same. Don't understand the question. Repeat that, please, or type it in. You're you're cutting out a bit. Oh okay, yeah, I'll try to think about how to articulate it. So twenty-three would be able to go and line up on that that edge and continue on down the long side. Yeah. That, that's the five will cover the um, yeah. thing of line. That's exactly right. And this is how you know which is the front, back, right, left. We said already that this corner is going to be the same as this one here by symmetry like if you twist it around you'll see that's the right one it's the opposite far corner right will be identical not in the mirror image identical this part here is going to be identical to the one that's on the short side there that's how this works that's think about that or just physically rotate it and you'll see that yes it fits there as it should so at this point yes Time to celebrate. We've got our first module built in the real house model. <laughs> this is good. It's technically correct and all of that. This is already more than most architects do. Unless they're getting to the fine level of bin detail. So, you want to document this. This is the start. Take a screenshot. And then... Um, we have not yet put up a placeholder in our part library. So I'm going to SH2CAD, which is I am right here. I want to set that up. So this is going to be the house location master file. Let's do the final assembly master file right above the part library. So I'm going to seed this properly here. Just keep a good paper trail on this. So. So I'm going to say house assembly, let's call it, is that good? House assembly, a master, let's call that. That's, you know, just as long as you're consistent here. So, so then copy and paste. What happened there? Is that good? Yeah, so house assembly is going to be right there. No. Uh, let's copy that house assembly master house assembly master house assembly master file and then in FreeCAD so now I have seeded the proper documentation of it in the part library so now anybody can visually inspect this and say oh okay cool uh, so I'm going to upload the picture, which I just clipped. This one. And then I'm going to upload the actual CAD file. So the CAD file is here is this house model final assembly. Let's see, do we have... Uh, oh, Katrina. 
How's the open source Panopticon? <laughs> Get, unmute yourself. So this is where I'd like to. I want to see like the quality of this. So just testing little inch by inch, improving the internet infrastructure. But how is this uh, sound here? We still want to have just a very simple thing. Jitsi Meet has an issue. We noticed that if you do a phone, there's no way to mute the thing. I can't mute my mm -hmm. phone. So I think we got to try like Google Hangouts or something else. Because um, right now I would like to have one camera on me and one camera sharing the screen so that I'm not switching back and forth, which I am currently. Katrina, you escaped. <laughs> uh, Katrina, come on back. Uh, yeah, yeah, we could do something. Yeah, uh, we have to use something. There's Jitsi. There's Google Meetings, uh, Google Hangouts, um, which is not open source. Uh, Katrina, uh, I guess she ran away. Uh, but let's try that tomorrow. So this is my office in the, in the house. I've got the three monitor system set up there, so it's really effective, and I've got a fast computer, so it's like, and I got gig because it's a landline. So it could be, uh, I can share my stuff here. I'm kind of fumbling a little bit. I can be more effective on that. So let's try that tomorrow for the morning session. Let's assume that works, and let's try it. So we'll just appear as normal. So, but for that to work, does everybody have headphones? Because um, then the, the feedback is not getting in the way if everyone's got the voice on. Uh, everyone got headphones? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, good. So we can put the headphones on and try that, see if that works, uh, how well that works. That's also practice for, you know, like when we have multiple sessions like this happening in different parts of the world, maybe you guys get your, your pads set up with operations and fabrication and we want to join in on these sessions remotely. So it's good to test it out. Um, okay, so wrapping up here on the on the CAD, uh, we did not yet upload the final file. So choose it, uh, the house model final assembly right there. Um, it's like that. Once again, it gets me that nag message. It thinks I uploaded the same thing. Ignore it. And there we go. So now you should have there it is so I'm kind of keeping track here what's being built like we start with that we went to that and this way it's absolutely transparent what the progress is you don't have to download a bunch of passes you look at this last picture in the part library and see where we're at so as soon as you have anything even an incomplete file that's maybe not correct just upload it let's see the progress it's also for morale purposes that people see that you're working and and it allows people to help you as well if it's completely incorrect or incomplete, just the fact that it's in the correct position, well, that's okay. Let's we can index off this file. We can say we can assume that let's assume that as soon as you have an update, you merge it into the final document and re-upload it. So this file here should have end up at the end of the day with a very long version history. We're putting in one part after another as we get it built in order to also encourage collaboration as well because then somebody else from remote can take it and continue working on it and actually orient it and, and contribute to where it needs to get contributed. Uh, the limit of the part library by itself is that, well, you don't know how they go together. Now we're putting that information into the document and putting it together. Um, so right here you will see there there it is if you click on that if you guys refresh and click on that can you download it right now and start working on that if you wanted to it should have turned blue yes you should be able to access that and that's that's how it works so we've got the first module and then the goal is to continue on every other one so if there's any other one that's uh, either there's many of them that are done so one person can actually manage th this file and start putting in all the latest latest modules now the first step being after oh do we forget something we did we we forgot to save this in a positionally correct position so you want to take this out of this picture 
and put it uploaded to actual wall module one so that when somebody downloads at the module level and merge into the final dock you're not having to move it again so once you get them positionally correct don't move them around in your original source dock because they won't end up in the same place in the final dock in the assembly so I'm, we need to take this and you don't want to take the sketch so so just control C open up a new file and control V so I did control V in this unnamed document uh, so I go to view and standard view fit all because these t things tend to like go off somewhere well naturally so because you probably end up starting at the origin and this thing is not at the origin it's way out like 16 feet out so go into view standard view fit all and that will put it into your viewpoint so now we know this if I save this here is going to be positionally correct and doesn't have any information it should probably have some placement information like um, axes and positions yeah look at that it actually reads the proper uh, so X is 378.5 um, which is 5.5 .5 less than 384 which is our 16 feet so that actually works the Y position is 48 um, why does it say 48 for that I don't really know um, and a Z position it calls it 107 so it's not we could do better than this by trying to get it see it's uh, probably you know what we should correct that because this will affect like it will make it harder for us to navigate altogether so let's do this let's take Z to zero I moved it way down so let's define the foundation point as Z equals zero and then the foundation is actually going negative that's fine because we don't know exactly where the foundation is it's a good point so turn I change it to zero for the Y, Y should also be, well, it's the, let's call that, for Y, y and X, it's actually not super transparent. Um, the Z I definitely did not like, but the X, Y, remember we did that when we drew our original coordinate system we started it at zero zero remember how I moved it to the zero point uh, so that is positionally correct so I actually won't mess with this anymore uh, but I don't know why the Z I was kinda expecting the Z to start at zero two when I did that but it actually didn't for some reason so I just fixed it right here to make it zero so I'm gonna save this um, so to save this as positionally correct one module one and uh, that's cool but we need to get it uploaded to the part library so go into here and go into upload a new version so definitely make a note positionally correct version Z equals zero now as far as Z, I'm gonna say Z equals zero in information because I'm right now I'm not sure where it's looking at if I we have that file where is it taking where is it looking from at the file that we created like is it looking at the top or bottom of it? I mean, I assume it would be the bottom of it, but what if it's actually taking it at the top? Um, I don't know. Okay, so maybe some things to figure out, just little details. But the thing we do have, as long as the our coordinate 16 by 32 aligns with our modules, we're positionally correct. Here we just went a little step, like make the Z a little simpler, so maybe it simplifies some things. Let's leave it at that, because we can get into the nitty-gritty of like exactly where is origin defined on each module and stuff like that okay let's let's not go there too much 
too much detail. Um, so let's save it. Okay, um, we saved it. Uh, position the correct module. Did we upload it? Yes, this is the correct version. Um, now, since we shifted that down, let's let's actually move that our original file down. So this is like the setup. Lots lots of little due diligence here, but because we move this down, we want to make make sure we move down our source positional file. So in this file right here, this one. Let's change that. Okay, so uh, I have that one on my desktop, so I'm gonna open it. So I believe that will be the house location. And when you look at this sketch, so let's let's actually uh, close up the other ones. If we look at this sketch, mm, that's weird because. It says it's actually at zero. Um, oh man, no. Let's then let's keep it at. So this says that this sketch position is zero zero zero, and if we double click on it, look at that. So I where's my axis here? So let's just get really clear about the coordinates. So the coordinates are x y. So it's like let's click out of there. Uh, so let's expand and um, okay so look at the coordinate system that I'm moving there let's see how so I'm looking at the arrows down in the corner here so I'm trying to put it into an intuitive position like XYZ like right now right so XY so meaning that this corner here I'm expecting to be Zero zero zero. I think so. That's where it went, right? Because uh, the Z. If you look at this coordinate graph at the bottom right, you see that the Z is going up like it should. You see that? Yes. That's good. I like that. Um, so this is we're looking in the XY plane the Z is coming towards you this information on a sketch says XYZ is zero all zeros let's let's believe since this is our master file let's believe that and I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and undo what I did with that other file so I'm gonna go back here into because we just moved this this which was an original file z is zero there so somehow for some reason that meant that the where it's measuring z on this file is not it's not really like the bottom left corner there's some weird stuff going there so i'm gonna just um for cd home wall module one um, I had the Z equals zero in information, but if we look at the history, the 859 is the transparent version of the last file, simplified dumb object. Um, okay, so here's my position. I'm going to delete that one. Um, and I'm going to merge yeah this is actually but this is kind of stuff you really got to be rigorous about this if we're all going to put things in the right position so I'm going to import not import but merge the wall module one I'm actually going to go back to to wall module one here because I think that's the one before I moved it no that's the no that's not the right one cancel let's get rid of that that's the one before I moved it. So let's merge the merge the one, the positionally correct one. So there it is. Yeah. So for some reason, it, you know, it's it's giving me this. We want to shift it back up. 
so I forget what that Z was if we look at the video recording we could get it but now let's just move it by hand um, so we know we gotta go just all the way up where this little corner goes back to the top so let's move it um, view move get that corner move it up move it back up oh yeah so it looks like it's snapped pretty well yeah it's pretty pretty accurate there mm -hmm. and let's see let's look at one let's look at two let's look at three yeah that's all good so it actually snapped right back so it's 160 I don't understand the coordinate it's 107 oh oh I see I see so it's 107.624 what is that that's nine foot minus the three eighths. Okay. Yeah, so that's correct. That's actually good. So what what this is telling me, if the Z is that, for some reason, it thinks that in this file, I don't know, it's it's not measuring it correctly compared to the original. That's that's that to me, I would consider a bug in FreeCAD because we know that we put this. Well, I don't know. It, we don't know where it's measuring that Z from. I mean, it's, that's undefined. We have to study the system more. But we know this is right here, so let's save it again. Um, and let's extract this now to... Um, actually, let's open up the other file, the positionally correct module 1. Uh, we're going to get rid of that because it wasn't positionally correct. I'm going to control V, the other one. Right, so let's get rid of that one. Okay, so now this is the proper positionally correct and if you save it like this save it in a way that is attractive for somebody to look at it like uh, so if I save it right now it saves it when you open it back up it's you'll see what I have here uh, if I save it right now here okay so now positionally correct version so I'm gonna upload new version um, let me make sure that I save this one I think I did yes so now I'm gonna make sure okay fi fixed positionally correct module okay yeah that should be good fixed position correct module there it is there's the process um, are you finished with the part library maintenance let's look at that uh, so go to the CAD um, so we've got the version visual version history here so you see what's been updated last that file we just if you click on that um, that is correct we know that we corrected this one I should actually correct this picture to be the one of the actual green module since here you cannot make a core even though it's a nice picture we have this one now in a different position uh, and that one is captured like right there so let's say we just superpose this. We actually don't have a screenshot. So for absolute proper maintenance, let's get a nice screenshot of this. Um, and we can do it maybe like from a front view. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, headphones. If you get into trouble, I had plug in your headphones. So I'm going to copy this and do the final piece of maintenance here. So I'm going to change this image file uh, by uploading. So edit here. Uh, so yeah, just just keep track. Now you see this process is manual. Like <laughs> maybe down the road we can automate this a little better, but we're just pasting things in so position so I'm gonna call that positionally
correct module one and I'm gonna put it into the picture of module one which is right there dot PNG so now we should have that superimposed no something went maybe didn't refresh yet no it's probably let's see what's wrong with that that didn't work so the file names have to be here positionally correct module one dot PNG oh wait sorry I didn't upload it yet right I forgot to upload it still don't yeah that, that's red still I forgot to upload it no problem um, so where is that one? Oh, where would that one go? So just save that. And there we go. Upload. Okay. So upload. Yeah, I forgot to upload that. Now we should have this. Bam. So now we correct that this is all. So you can kind of correspond this one to that one. You can kind of see they're the same thing. So you're more oriented. But this shows you, yes, this module one is done at this level and it's positionally correct. So when you do that, so that's that's a long explanation. Like if I'm not explaining this, um, it'll take you a little shorter. But you, you really want to go through this due diligence if you want to generate a complete model. The, the benefit of this is that you can actually get many people working. So like for a single person, this is like really exhaustive. This is this is uh, too much. That's why nobody does this. Um, but for large group wor workflow with similar modules, it's tractable. Each person has to do only so much of it, like after you do the do the module, put it in the correct position, save it, upload your thumbnails so you keep the version history clean, the visual version history, then you upload it, upload the thumbnail and the positionally correct file over the one that you just downloaded that wasn't positionally correct. And that way we're good distance into it because this module this this CAD here now yes it's our it's like it's very little it's just that one module but it's actually right it's actually technically correct there's a lot of technical detail in there already and people can orient around it so I think I'll leave it at that and let's work on the CAD modules making them positionally correct and at the end of the day, let's see how much of this first floor we can get put in um, in the CAD, in the virtual world. Does that sound good? Any questions? Uh, I've been having a little bit of difficulty with um, the uh, constraints, uh, getting the constraints uh, from one uh, body in the object uh, to another. I haven't quite cracked how to uh, how to transfer those constraints between bodies. Are you using FreeCAD 16? Uh, I'm using, oh, I'm using uh, point .19. If you use 16, that goes away. Oh, wow, okay. That's why we're saying, thank you. You made a case for FreeCAD 16. So FreeCAD 19 has additional complexity, what he just described. There's body objects and trash in the part tree. <laughs> to us, is trash because we don't need it. Uh, so let's simplify it. If you go to 16, this problem goes away. It's not, it doesn't use those body object things. Uh, it's higher performance features that are not necessarily needed in our very basic workflow. So go back to FreeCAD 16 and that will be solved. I thought you were having problem like things snapping to each other, but that's all we're doing. We're just moving and rotating things. That's all we're doing. Okay. And beyond that, the body objects are extraneous information for what we need to do. It, this is already complicated enough. Uh, we can keep it a little simpler by not, not getting to that. There's just more objects in the part tree that we have to cons concern ourselves with that confuse novices. Yeah. Yeah, right, so, thank you. so migrate down and you'll be all right. Okay. Um, any other questions on the process? So I think we've got somewhat of a handle on it. 
uh, we'll keep repeating this until we get really good at this. It's like, at the end of the day, I mean, the kind of goal here is a large group of people that can execute on a new design in rapid time and, and create economically significant results. I mean, that's quite valuable. So this process is worth learning. And as we talked to the architects last night, they, they were impressed. Like, yeah, this is actually high tech work. This is, we are getting the full details in there. They don't typically do this. We're doing more, but because our goals are higher, we want to solve housing. So we need to go all the way on this kind of stuff. So, yeah. <coughs> and that will wrap up our morning session. And then let's get, let's divvy up once again the CAD, go into the orientation within uh, the role allocation images, or go into, let's see, that we have a, a spreadsheet with all the status of completion. That should be, okay, if we're on day five, so on my log, go to, day, sorry, day six. So we're at day six. The working doc is there. Uh, under links, you have the seed home build status spreadsheet we are tracking the things that we have built in there and CAD file is being tracked in column I. So <clears throat> that's the CAD files. We can, so obviously there's very few of them that have been put into the spreadsheet so we can actually track this here as well. This is actually better because we've got the graphics in there and we've got the spreadsheet. So this is actually, I would say, this is uh, more convenient. Yeah, let's do this. This is good. But as you see here, yeah, none of these are here. Interior walls not there yet. In the afternoon, I think we can start on the interior walls. We'll uh, get prepped up on that. Um, but then we've got just a, the windows and doors to finish up. We'll get into that later. In the, in the meantime, let's let's complete as many of the CAD files as possible, put them in the correct position. So I'll link, uh, I'll embed that within our working wiki thing. So I'm gonna say tracking. We really gotta do the tracking spreadsheet. As, yeah, that's an important asset. Let's put it in here. tracking uh, progress tracker this so you can embed these spreadsheets as well as a web page not web page but embed embed here okay that's the embed code so Progress tracker is embedded, so this is our current day work. Twenty design lessons day six. Progress tracker is in there if you want to click into it or edit it. So that's about it. Yeah, the progress tracker is perhaps the best best tool here to use in terms of progress and tracking what everybody's working on. Okay, so leave it at that.
now. Stop recording.